Daniel chapter 5 is our destination this morning as we continue our series through the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 5 and we're going to read the whole chapter verses 1 through 31 of Daniel chapter 5. Let's read together. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessel that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's colour changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his colour changed and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you, or your colour change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans and astrologers because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show me the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, You shall be clothed with purple and a chain of gold around your neck and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, His mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind, and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house you have brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the Lord in whose hand is your breath, 
and who and whose are all your ways you have not honored then from the present then from his presence the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed and this is the writing that was inscribed mene mene tekel and parsin this is the interpretation of the matter mene god has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end tekel you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting perez your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was chained with purple, with, was clothed with purple, and a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Let's pray. Father, we love your word and we desire more than anything to be a people of your word. Father, we're thankful for your word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Father, we're thankful that your word to us is love and rescue and redemption. Now, Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit so that we would see and savour Jesus Christ in Daniel chapter 5. Because that's what we're here for. That's what you made us for. Have mercy on us now in this time, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The gold rush of 1842 changed everything. During the gold rush, 300,000 people, a huge number for that time, travelled west to California. And it was a direct result of the gold rush that meant that California gained its statehood. I guess we can all decide for ourselves whether that was good news or bad news. But those 300,000 people who travelled west to make their fortune quickly needed to learn an important lesson. They needed to learn that all that glitters isn't gold. All that glitters isn't gold. Maybe you've had that moment in your life too where you have realised that all that glitters isn't gold something you've depended on, something you've built on, something you've invested in, something that you thought was valuable, something that you thought was gold, was merely glitter. That's what happens this morning in Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, we meet a new king, a king named Belshazzar. He was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And he was about to discover what we all need to discover, that all that glitters isn't gold all that glitters isn't gold the first eight verses of this chapter remind us that it is the enemies of God who love what glitters friends listen up if you don't have God as the center of your life if you don't have God as your supreme treasure if you don't have God as your foundational joy if you don't have God as the absolute middle of your thoughts and your loves and your actions all you have is what glitters God alone is worthy of your life and that's what Belshazzar had to learn verse 1 shows us the glitter of false security King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Verses 30 and 31 remind us that the enemy is at the gate, that the army of the Medes and Persians is just outside the city walls. But King Belshazzar feels secure. He isn't worried. And he makes a great feast for a thousand lords and their wives and their concubines. He was entranced, he was distracted, he was moved by the glitter of false security and by the glitter of false pride. The glitter of false pride. Belshazzar tastes the wine and he commands that the vessels that had been captured from the temple in Jerusalem were bought. And he uses those sacred vessels, those gold and silver vessels that God had commanded to be made for worship, he uses them to drink his wine from. This is the glitter of false pride. Belshazzar wants us all to know, I'm more powerful than my predecessor, 
Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar never used them. I'm more powerful than the God of Israel because here I am using the things that are supposed to be for worship to have a good time. The glitter of false security, the glitter of false pride and false power. But how quickly it all changes. Verse 5, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's colour changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. How quickly everything changes. The banquet looked good, it smelled good, it tasted good, but it was a banquet on the edge of the grave. That's all our lives outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, everything is a banquet on the, edge of the, on the edge of the grave. Outside of Christ, we have no real security. We have no real power. Outside of Christ, we have nothing. Every Christless life is just glitter and no gold. All Christless life, no matter how good it looks is just a banquet on the edge of the grave. And when judgment comes, there is no defence. The enemies of God love what glitters. But God's people love what is gold. God's people love what is gold. Verse 10, The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your colour change. Just when Belshazzar thought it couldn't get any worse, here comes his mom to embarrass him in front of all his friends. There's a universal experience for us. Now we know the queen here isn't Belshazzar's wife because we've already been told that Belshazzar's wife is at the feast. So this might be the queen mother, this might be Belshazzar's mum, or it might be Belshazzar's grandmother, who, who lived to be about 104 years old. So she comes and she reminds the king of a man in his kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. Of course, she's talking about Daniel. Now, it, it's not really clear why Daniel wasn't involved with the other wise men that came when King Belshazzar called. Maybe the king was so determined to be different from Nebuchadnezzar, he excluded Daniel because Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar were so close. But the wise queen recommends Daniel. Now let Daniel be called, the end of verse 12, and he will show the interpretation that's the wise queen. Then we see the foolishness of the king. Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show me the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but King Belshazzar's whole spirit here is very much, here we are now, entertain us, isn't it? He calls Daniel an exile in verse 13. He wants Daniel to remember, listen, I'm not impressed by you. I'm not interested in you. You're an exile. You are essentially my captive and my slave. He puts Daniel in his place straight away. Twice in these few verses, he says, I have heard you can do this. I have heard you can do this. Belshazzar is foolish. There's nothing glittering about Daniel. Brothers and sisters, we have to reconcile this thought in our heads. The people of God do not look attractive to an outside world. The church doesn't look attractive to an outside world. First time I went to church, 16, not saved, bored out of my mind. Next time I went to church, 
got saved, 17. Church was extraordinary. Church was amazing. Church was so exciting. And I thought, what's changed? What have they changed the church to make it interesting? Nothing. I changed. Your love for the gathered worship of God's people is one of the clearest assurances you can have of your salvation and of your, and of your new birth. But friends, we go off track. The church goes off track when she decides to use the world's methods to attract the world. When the church decides to ape and imitate the world to win the world. No, no, no. We stick with God. We stick with God's words. I love Daniel's response in verse 17. Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now, Daniel's been offered a purple robe, a gold chain. He's been offered the third place in the kingdom and he is not interested. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Daniel is completely immune to the threats and promises of the world around him. Can you imagine the freedom we would have as believers if we were immune and unmoved by the threats and the promises of the world around us? This is a heart captured by the glory of God. This is a heart longing for the joy that only God can give. Daniel's not interested in King Belshazzar because he knows he serves a better king. Daniel is not interested in the rewards that Belshazzar can offer because he knows he has waiting for him a better reward. Belshazzar tried to insult him by calling him an exile. But that's exactly what he is. He's an exile. He's not just an exile from Jerusalem in Babylon. He's an exile from the kingdom of heaven living on earth. He's an exile from the pleasures of life because he has been conquered by heavenly pleasure. He's been conquered by divine pleasure. He's been conquered by divine love. And when divine love conquers our hearts, when divine pleasure overwhelms the pleasure of the world, then the world has nothing to offer us. And we are not scared of the world's threats. We are not enticed by the world's promises. The world has nothing to offer us because we have everything in God. Christian, you have everything in God. Every spiritual blessing comes to you from the cross. Every spiritual blessing comes to you from the empty tomb. What are you looking for in the world that you cannot get 10,000 times better and forever in Christ? C.S. Lewis reminds us, <laughs> C.S. Lewis reminds us that all sinful joy is theft and imitation. The devil cannot create joy. All joy comes from heaven. All joy comes from Jesus. Now we can experience that joy and chase that joy and glut ourselves on that joy in a sinful way. But the devil himself can't create it. All joy comes from Jesus. Friends, the only way... Listen, the only way we're going to make it in a world that is increasingly opposed to believers is to go deep, deep, deep into the Word of God. Because in the Word of God, we meet the God of the Word, the only God that can satisfy, the only God that can fortify, the only God that can defend, the only God that can protect. I graduated from college. I've got to stop walking back and forth. That's so distracting, I know. I'm going to stand right here. I graduated from college 20 years ago, and, and, and it's a different world now from what it was 20 years ago. Can you imagine those kids that are back there with Rachel, what, what they're going to be facing when they're in their teens and 20s and 30s? Brothers and sisters, we've got to prepare them. We've got to go deep with God or we are not going to make it. 
We've got to go deep with God, otherwise we will be silenced by the threats of the world. Or we will be enticed away by the temptations of the world. But Daniel is our model in verse 17. Let your gifts be for yourself. Give your rewards to another. God's people love what is gold. The world has nothing to offer us because we have everything in God. So we must know the difference. Verses 19 through 21, Daniel addresses King Belshazzar and reminds him of what we saw last week in Daniel chapter 4 about the, the, the madness and recovery of King Nebuchadnezzar. He does that so he can get to verse 22. Verse 22, and you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. Belshazzar knew and maybe even saw the madness, the judgment of King Nebuchadnezzar. He knew that God judged Nebuchadnezzar, took away his reason, took away his kingdom for seven years. This should have taught King Belshazzar the difference between what is gold and what glitters. But as verse 23 shows us, he didn't learn that difference the end of verse 23 the God in whose hand is your breath and and whose are all your ways you have not honored and then finally verses 24 through 28 we finally get the interpretation then from God's hand the from God's presence his hand was sent and this writing was inscribed and this is the writing that was inscribed Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, those three words, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin, are actually the names of, of Babylonian coins. It would be like a hand writing on the wall, dollar, cent, and a half, something like that but these words also sound like the words for numbered weighed and divided and this is the interpretation king belshazzar has been numbered he's been weighed he's been found wanting and he will lose everything friend one day you will be numbered and you will be weighed the day that King Belshazzar experienced in October 539 BC, that day is also coming for you. Where you will stand alone before the king of the universe and you will be numbered and you will be weighed. And here's where the false security of time wraps around us like a blanket. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm this, I'm that. That day is years away for me. I spoke to Monty on Monday. On Tuesday, we exchanged voicemails. We missed each other. On Wednesday, this day came for Monty. He went to be with the Lord. Now, he was clothed in Christ's righteousness because of his faith in Jesus. So this judgment wasn't a judgment of heaven or hell for him. This was an assessment of the deeds he had done in the flesh. But King Belshazzar has been numbered, weighed and found wanting. His kingdom will be divided and given to the Persians. Friends, if you don't have everything in Christ, you don't have anything. If your life isn't built on the treasure of God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, fed to us in the word of God, you, like Belshazzar, will be numbered, weighed and found wanting. Verse 29 is almost laughably absurd, isn't it? King Belshazzar has just found out he's going to lose his kingdom that very night. But instead of repenting, instead of dealing with that, he puts a chain and a robe on Daniel and proclaims him third in the kingdom, this kingdom that at this point has hours, maybe minutes left. How far judgment seems until it is too late. How quickly judgment comes when it's too late for us to do anything 
about it. That very night, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was ki killed, and Marriott, Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. We live in a world that, that hates talk of judgment. It's not quite true. We live in a world that loves to judge, loves to judge, but hates talk of judgment. Friends, this is why you must let the word of God shape your categories. Because this story wasn't for the Medes or for the Persians, even though it's about a Persian king, even though it's about the king of the Medes, even though it's about the king of the Babylonians, it wasn't for people in Babylon or Media or Persia. It is for us. And this is not a story that's just about the events of October 539. It is a story relevant to us in October 2023. If we are God's people, we must know the difference between what glitters and what is gold? I wonder what glitters in your life. Maybe you're like King Belshazzar. You are blinded by the, the gleam and the glitter of false security. You've got a nice income, or, or you've got a good retirement plan, or you've got your health, or you've got a great house, or you've got great kids, or you've got, again, plenty of time. There's the devil's greatest trick, that there's no... Hurry. These things all glitter, but they can't save you when judgment comes. Your 401k did not die on the cross for you. Your professional advancement isn't coming with you into the grave. Maybe some of us today need to repent of trusting too much, putting too much security in things of the world. Maybe it's not so much false security. Maybe it's not so much that, that decision to put Christ to one side and pursue other things for the sake of security. Maybe it's just distractions. Maybe it's just distractions. We live in a distracted age. We live in a distracted age. This afternoon, go home and, and try and follow one train of thought for one minute. That, that's, that's a struggle. And, unless I'm writing, that's why I write everything down. Unless I'm writing, I can't do it. And if you can do one minute, do five minutes. If you can do ten minutes, you're a genius. But we live in a distracted age. John Piper says... One of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that our prayerlessness was not caused by lack of time. And you can replace social media there with anything. One of the great uses of distraction will be to prove at the last day that our prayerlessness was not caused by lack of time. Friends, don't tell me you don't have time to read the Bible through in a year. You have time, you just don't really want to. 15 minutes a day, you can read the whole Bible through in a year. Think how much spiritual good that would do you. Think how much deeper your joy would be. Think how much bigger your vision of God would be. Think how much less attractive sin would be. 15 minutes a day. If you're like me, you spend 15 minutes a day staring out of the window. And if you really don't have 15 minutes in your day, get up 15 minutes earlier. Well, get up 20 minutes earlier so you, you get to hit snooze once and, and, then, and then you can read the Bible. A distraction is anything that makes the Lord Jesus look unimportant or unimpressive things that glitter but that aren't gold things that look good and that feel good but that can't save us when judgment comes 
I wonder, what is your attitude to worship? That, that's where Belshazzar starts going wrong, isn't it? Verses 2 through 4, he's way too casual about worship. Friends, what's your attitude towards worship? Is church what happens? When everything else is taken care of? Or is church the centre and you build from everything around that? You think, 10 o'clock on Sunday, I'm going to be at church. I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there early. My heart's going to be prepared. Are we ready to sing, ready to give, ready to speak to get to people, ready to worship? Everything else orbits around that. Or, or is church just what happens if everything else in your, li- in your week lines up? What about your attitude towards those who don't know Christ? What about your attitude towards those who don't know Christ? Pastor Brian Chappell asks asks us this question, quote, Is it possible that today's church has lost the power to turn God's people from sin precisely because we do not grieve over the effects of sin in their lives? Are our friends and family members wandering away because they know that no one will grieve if they are lost or damaged by their wayward choices? Friends, let's develop hearts that are grieved by our sin. Let's develop hearts that are grieved by the sins of those that we love. I think of Jesus walking down into Jerusalem, weeping over the city. What a great model he is for us. Friends, when we, be- when we become distracted by the world, and when we are made to feel secure in the world, we become spiritual fools. Every Christless pleasure is a banquet on the edge of the grave. These things may glitter, but they're not gold. Anything else you build your life around apart from Christ can't help you when judgment comes. But there is good news for fools like us. There is good news for sinners like us. There is good news for the wayward and the distracted like us. There is a kingdom that is gold. And we are invited in. Salvation is completely free. It will cost you everything. But it is completely free. In salvation, Jesus comes and he says, give up what you can't keep and gain what you can't lose. Stop doing the things that are killing you and come to me and have life. That's the offer of salvation. This kingdom is gold, but it doesn't glitter. (laughs) This kingdom looks small and insignificant. A shepherd boy with a few stones against a giant. A ragtag group of former slaves taking a nation. A baby born in a stable to two terrified young parents. This kingdom doesn't glitter. You and I, we follow a crucified saviour. Let's stop expecting the world to do us a favour. Let's stop expecting the world to do us a favour. We are a people that reject what the world tempts us with. We meet at the start of every week, to sing and to give and to hear from the Word of God. People don't really understand what we're doing. Maybe you don't really understand what we're doing. The kingdom of God doesn't glitter, but it is gold. The kingdom of God is gold because God himself is worth all the treasure, all the pleasure in the world. John tells us in Revelation that the the city of God, the city of heaven, doesn't have a sun in the sky because the Lamb is its lamp. 
that the glory of the Lord Jesus is so bright that we don't need the sun because we have Jesus. We don't need anything if we have Jesus. And the Christian life is simply the constant lesson learning that. That if we have Jesus, we don't lack anything. And if we have Jesus, we don't need to fear anything. If we have Jesus, when our judgment comes, we will not be weighed and found wanting. We will be weighed and welcomed. We will get to heaven and we will say, Oh, he thought of me. That's what went through Monte's mind about 4.30 on Wednesday afternoon. He got to heaven and he thought, Oh, Jesus thought of me. Friends, if you have Jesus, you have everything. Do not be distracted. Do not be threatened by a lost and dying world that cannot take your joy. But go deep with Jesus and do not fear judgment. Go deep with the God of the Word, in the Word of God, and you have nothing to fear from this life or from what comes next. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. God, our Father, we're so thankful for the Lord Jesus. And thankful is not even beginning to scratch the surface. Thank you, Lord, that we will have an eternity to sing your praises, to be thankful. Lord, forgive me when I put my security in other things. Lord, forgive me for when I put my security in in what I can buy or what I can do or how impressive I can look. Lord, forgive me when I'm distracted. Lord, forgive me for the things that, that I place in front of my heart that make you look unimportant or unimpressive. Lord, would you in your kindness remind us that if we have you, we have everything and the promises of the world must fall on deaf ears. Lord, would you remind us that if we have you, we have everything and the threats of the world can't harm us. Would you remind us, Lord Jesus, that if we have you, we have nothing to fear in this life or in the life to come. Lord, we're thankful for your word. Fill us with your spirit now and shape us with your word, we ask in Jesus' name.